everyone, verses 12 through 15. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. Thank you. everybody. Uh, this morning we're going to be uh, continuing our series on truth telling and this uh, I'm going to be talking about testimony, a specific type of truth telling. But before we get into the sermon, uh, because we're talking about testimonies today, um, I've asked a couple of people to give testimony or basically just share what God is doing in their lives. Their lives. And uh, so we're going to hear from Serena, and then still. So, um, they're going to give their testimonies first, and then we'll dive into the service, okay? So, come on. <laughs> I think that makes sense. Alright. I didn't time myself, so hopefully this won't be too long. Um... Hi everyone, my name is Serena. Uh, I uh, wanted to share a little bit about my uh, background, both as a Christian and experience with God. Um, I grew up going to church on Sundays in Taiwan. Uh, my dad is not a Christian. My mom was uh, invited by her friends to attend church. So she thought it was a great way for us to get out of bed early on Sunday. <laughs> like you guys do. Uh, so my sister and I went regularly on to Sunday schools and to Sunday service and I even um, one of you Bible memory first compass. How is that? <laughs> is that so hard to believe? <laughs> anyway, um, I called myself a Christian because I went to church, I prayed to God for blessing before tests, uh, before flying on planes, just so I could land safely. Um, but I don't think I had a personal connection with God, nor did I live my life guided by his values or his truths. Um, after I moved to Canada, this was in middle school, I stopped going to church because I interfered with my schoolwork uh, and encroached my, on my own free time, I thought. Um, but throughout my childhood and adolescence, there was always things that genuinely bugged me about myself I couldn't really shake off. Things like, if my friends won a competition or a scholarship, why was my first reaction often envy and that maybe I deserved it more instead of rejoicing for their success? Uh, when my sister was praised for her good behavior, why did I secretly hate it? And the adults, and also the adults, for not paying attention to me. Um, and whenever I met a new person, either whether they're British or average looking, whether they're tall or short, skinny or chubby, athletic or nerdy, um, I always felt myself constantly comparing myself to them. And at least trying to find one thing that I have to be better at them, just to feel better about myself. Uh, because of all this stuff, focus and insecurity, I never truly felt a connection with anybody, uh, or never truly felt that I could be open and free to talk to anybody, and inside of myself harbored a lot of this inner ugliness, and literally felt like I was a very grumpy, shriveled up person inside. It was a very vicious cycle, you know, every time, every time any interaction I had. Um, so, um, in uh, Romans 7 to 8, uh, where Paul talks about struggling with sin, gaining life through the Spirit. Uh, in Romans 7, 14 to 24, just a, sl uh, a small snippet, uh, he says, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. I knew that all of these thoughts and feelings were not right, and I wasn't meant to think or live like this, but I didn't really know what other alternative there was um, besides all these thoughts that I had to make up. Or at least I wasn't open to the alternative. Um, God did graciously uh, bring me back to the church um, uh, in college, and he opened my eyes to my biggest problem, which was sin. Sin was the root of my self-centeredness, jealousy, envy, inability to rejoice with other people, feeling disconnected and alone. And like what Paul said, I was a prisoner, a slave to sin, to insecurity, to feeling unappreciated and unloved, and ultimately separated from God. Um, and again, in Romans 17, and eight, um, he talks about for it 
If you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the Spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the Spirit of sonship. And by Him we cry, I'm sorry, by Him we cry, Abba, Father. So salvation from sin through faith in Jesus Christ is a freedom that I was able to gain from sin, from having to constantly compare myself because I was already dearly loved by God, who is my Father, and I do not have to fight or try to earn recognition. It was a freedom from feeling inadequate or insecure about myself, um, as I was dearly, uh, as I am dearly loved by God. I don't have to be jealous or envious, and the focus shifted away from myself but towards God. Now that I didn't have to feel the need to fight for attention, um, having been filled by God's love, there is freedom to finally connect with others, to be genuinely happy. Uh, for others, and this transformation was so dramatic um, in my life that I cannot imagine how I would have tripped out if I uh, didn't experience this and didn't have the Spirit of God um, reveal that to me. I finally understood what it was, uh, what it meant when people said God, God's love overflows, because before it was just flowing within myself, but uh, through Him, um, it overflows. Um, and I felt like this was the most precious kind of freedom, a freedom from being tied down by sin and only concerned about myself, freedom to finally connect with God, who is the source of life. Uh, as he said in John um, 4.14, But so whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Freedom to not be constantly wary, wary of what people thought of me, or, or what if I did, uh, or what if... Oh, what I do, sorry, uh, pleases everybody. And there is freedom to finally see people the way that God sees them, precious brothers and sisters, not competitors. This is a freedom that Jesus brings, uh, brought me through salvation from sin, a freedom that restores uh, my relationship with him and also with one another as God had intended. Um, a little um, story, uh, back in 2009, I was in China for five weeks as part of this medical mission program. Um, I got to stay with missionaries um, who came from the U.S. Some of them were physicians, some were dentists, others were lay people who just went up the mission field over two decades ago. We met um, a fellowship, a church, and people's homes, and I met a lot of very precious brothers and sisters in Christ. And outside of being Chinese, um, and some of these missionaries are Caucasian, and some of them were 20 years older than me, so we didn't have a lot of things in common. But so for the Asian 20 year older people, I had even less in common with them. Um, but because of that fundamental connection as children of God, we were saved by grace for the cross, which is a connection I don't think we can find anywhere else um, outside of Jesus. Uh, we were able to relate freely with each other, be honest with each other about the struggles that we went through, our hopes for the future, our downfalls, our triumphs, but to eat and have fun and share lives together, sing hymns and worship together. And in this little corner of China, but I knew that God really delighted his people. And he just gave me a glimpse of what a day will be like when the world is made bright and restored. It's filled with peace and love, not competition with scarce resources. Um, and what a day it is now, too, that we can live in freedom, restored to him and to the rest of humanity, uh, one person at a time and one hand.
kind of just really in a dark place um, in my mind and also just at, at that workplace. Um, and I really dreaded Sundays because Sundays meant that I would have to go to work the next day, which made me really unhappy. Um, and sometimes I would uh, cry on my way to work, which really kind of sad. <laughs> And um, all the time I was just always praying, you know, God will keep me sane and uh, save me from this crazy place. Um, and so I went uh, job hunting, and after a while, I, uh, I got a verbal offer from a company that I really, really wanted to work at. And typically when you get a job offer, um, after a verbal offer, they send you something in writing. Um, it'll either be via mail or email or something. Um, but for some reason, they kept saying, oh, we'll send it to you tomorrow, we'll send it to you tomorrow. Um, and that eventually was like, oh, uh, the end of the week or next week, and it was just dragging on and on. And I was like, why, God? Like, why is this taking me so long? Um, like, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but like, I can't get there. Um, and it was, it was really difficult. Um, and, you know, throughout that time, I was just kind of, you know, thinking God, I'm wondering, you know, why, uh, why is this happening? And I really felt called to just kind of love on the team that I had managed there and really just show them that um, I cared for them and that, you know, like, we, I should treat them right and just show them, like, you know, how life is supposed to be um, and it's not supposed to be crazy. Um, so I spent a lot of my time doing that while I was kind of waiting. And um, sure enough, almost three or four weeks I finally got my offer, an uh, actual formal one, and I was able to put in my two weeks notice, and I was super excited about that. Um, and even during that time, it was still kind of stressful during the last two weeks of my job, and I used to go running a lot um, just to de-stress, and um, I went to Miramar Lake one day, and I was thinking, oh, the sunset's going to be really nice today because it's cloudy, and that makes it a really pretty sunset. I finished my run and I was just uh, hanging out, stretching, and I was looking in the sky and I noticed that all these um, dark gray clouds had kind of covered up the sun completely. And all you could see was the sun still shining very brightly, um, but it kind of created a silver lining around the clouds. And um, I half, uh, half sarcastically, half self convincingly said, well, at least there's a silver lining um, in my head about the current job situation. Um, and for, for those of you guys who don't know the reference, it's kind of like every black cloud has a silver lining, which means that in every bad situation, there's a little bit of good. And so I kind of made that remark in my head. And um, as soon as I thought that, the clouds started parting. Um, and the sun just got brighter and brighter and brighter. And it was so bright that you know the, the sun had become just on its own with all the clouds parting. At that moment, I really, I smiled because I was like, oh, you know, God hears me and he, he's revealing himself to me and his light is brighter than all this darkness that's in my mind, that's in my job. And I just felt really at peace and just assured that things were going to be okay. Um, and God really spoke to me at that moment the way that I needed to be spoken to. Um, so... You know, we had a few days left at my at my job, and uh, I wanted to take my team out to dinner just to uh, thank them and tell them how much I appreciated them. And um, I took them out um, somewhere, and then they actually paid for my dinner, and they told me um, how much they appreciated me and just thanked me for you know being a good manager and um, helping them stay away from like the craziness. And I was just so touched by that. Like, it was really um, an affirmation that, you know, what I had been doing there was what God wanted me to do there. Um, so, after that, I, uh, I started my new job, and it was the best job I've ever had. Um, so, all this to say that, that God's always working in our lives, and He hears us, and, you know, the people and the situations He puts into your life, He's working.
Father God, I just thank you for the testimonies of how you've been working in both the lives of Serena and Stell, and just the, the transformation, the light that you shine in their lives, and just being there, just working, just being real, um, and just that the, for giving them the stories to share with us, Lord. Um, I just pray for them, and just pray that you'll continue to work in their lives, continue to be there, continue to be blessing them, continue to change them, Lord. Um, I pray these things in your name. Amen. Um, sometimes I go out, and I meet some people, right? And I don't know who they are, but I know they know who I am. And one time I remember going to this wedding. I'm a wedding photographer. And I saw the groom. And the groom looked really familiar, okay? And then he's like, hey, Daniel. I'm like, I have no idea who you are. <laughs> but he seemed to know exactly who I was. And then he said, remember I came to church one day and you told this story about Street Fighter and it was so funny or whatever. I'm like, I don't remember you. I don't remember that sermon. I don't remember that story. I remember none of that, right? But somehow he remembered a story about Street Fighter or something that I told. I guess he came to church one day. I don't know, right? Um, but what was interesting to me about that was that he remembered he remembered specifically what was happening because of the story. He told me, I don't remember what you said, but I remember the story. <laughs> and a lot of you guys have told me the same thing. Like, you remember some of the stories, but you might not remember, you know, exactly what the sermon was about. It's normal. That's the way it is, right? Um, I think that in our lives, as human beings, uh, we are storytelling people. There's this book called Storytelling Animals, about how, that I read one time, about how essential stories are to being human. And, um, uh, here's a couple quotes, okay? Uh, there's, this is not the book I read, but another guy said that telling stories is as basic to human beings as eating. More so, in fact, for while food makes us live, stories are what makes our lives worth it. Um, stories are just so so big part of us, you know, we, we turn on the TV, what do you see? Stories. You watch a movie, what do you see? Stories, right? Even if you listen to music, a lot of times there's a story in the song, you know, there's an entire genre of music about storytelling through music, it's called country music, right? There's like <laughs> stories everywhere, you play a video game, and if you play a video game it has no storyline, you're just like, Every, even the video games, they have to try to make a storyline and make cutscenes in movies to make it interesting, you know? Um, when you're talking to people, we tell each other stories all the time. Before there was any technology, people sat around and told each other stories. And in fact, the Word of God, the Bible, is full of stories. It's all told in narrative. It's all told, and a lot of it is told in a storytelling format. Why? Because we're storytelling animals, you know, that's who we are, okay? Um, even Jesus just constantly told stories. That was just an essential part of how he taught, right? He, Jesus, was never without a story when he spoke. You know, he was telling parables all, all, all the time. Because stories, they grab us, they capture us, they give meaning they help us to remember, and they're really, they're, they impact our lives. Um, and today, I want to talk to you guys about uh, testimony. And testimony is a specific type of story, okay? And testimony is a story that I'm going to define, this is not, you know, if you look it up in the dictionary, you're not going to find this definition. But this is our working definition for today, okay? Testimony is a true story remembering what God has done. And we've heard a couple testimonies from uh, Serena and Phil, and they both told stories. And they both remember what God has done in their lives. And they're both true stories about what happened to them, okay? So, for the purposes of today, I'm going to talk about testimony as telling true stories, remembering what God has done. 
And our passage today is in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, 12 to 15. Okay? Even last week, okay, we're in a series. The first is just a three-week series. First week I talked about preaching and truth-telling in terms of preaching. Last week, Clarence told you guys about how we're not, we're not a non-profit organization. We are a church that should be full of prophecy, meaning being able to speak truth in specific circumstances to specific people or groups of people in, into your life, right? So from one person to another, right? That's what prophecy is. It's the word of God, right? And Clarence talked about that last week. This week, I'm going to talk about testimony. And testimony is another type of truth-telling. It's a truth-telling through story. And the story is remembering what God has done in our lives. Okay? Remembering what God has done in our lives. Let's look at this, this uh, verse. 2 Peter 1, 12-15. Okay? It says, and as I read this, I'm going to point out some really, some keywords. Okay? Um, it says, so I will always remind, remind you of all of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear. And I will make every effort after my depart to see that after my departure you will always be able to to remember these things, okay? So what's going on in this passage is that Peter knows he's going to die. And when you die, you're going to die. You want to pass certain things on, okay? Now what does he want to pass on? He wants to pass on the truth. Of what? Of what? Of what he remembers, so that they can remember, okay? And then after, if you continue reading on in this passage, he, t he tells a little story about how... Um, he saw Jesus and how God anointed him, saying, this is my son, with whom I'm well pleased, right? Um, he told a little story of an experience with Jesus, okay? So, Peter's really giving a testimony. He wants to give a testimony which is true, which is, it says, established in the truth you now have. And the second thing is he wants us, he's remembering so that we can remember. Okay, so testimony has two parts that I want you guys to kind of think of. It's the truth, it's a true story, and it's about remembering. Okay? True story, and it's about remembering what God has done. Okay? So the first thing is that testimony comes, it's a legal term. You, you give a testimony, and you're called to the witness stand, They'll, re they'll transcribe your testimony. And you give a testimony about what you've seen happen. Okay? So it's, it's a pretty formal thing. It's like, hey, I'm giving a testimony in court law. That's where the term originates from. Okay? And then in the New Testament, they start talking about testifying about Jesus. Why, why were they saying that? Because they wanted to give a true, a, a solemn, like, I promise you this is what happened. I'm giving you evidence about who Jesus was, that he really rose from the dead. Okay? So then the word came, was uh, purely legal, then it became uh, testifying about the truth of Jesus in a really like, evidential form. Like, I'm giving you evidence. Today, now we use it as we're going to testify about Jesus. We're going to testify about what God has done. We're giving a testimony. It's less formal now. You know, we're not in a courtroom anymore. We're in church, you know. But it still has some of that same thing, stuff. One of the, the aspects that's really important about testimony is that it's true. Okay? Testimonies need to be true. How many of you guys have ever watched a movie and you're like, oh, that was a great movie, and at the end it said, based on a true story. You know? I've, I've watched some of those movies where I thought, oh, that's a decent story, and then all of a sudden it's a based whoa, that was an awesome story, you know? So, and then I look on Wikipedia and look it all up and stuff like that, you know? One of those movies that we saw recently was that one about um, Mary Poppins. That was me. Oh, anyway. Okay, so after I found out that, I knew that was a true story, and 
because of that, just get more intrigued and want to find out all the details about what happened and all that. Because certain stories are based on true stories or because they're true, they actually happened in real life, it makes it more powerful. It makes it more real. Why? Why is it more real? Because it's real. You know? It's real because it actually happened. It's not a, a something made up, right? And going back to 2 Peter, it says, We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and, and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? We did not follow... Do I have that up here? No. Yes. <laughs> says, we did not follow cleverly devised stories. Meaning, we didn't make this stuff up. This is real. Yeah, if I made up a story about a guy who was from the dead, oh, that's a good story. But if it's real, then it's real. If it's real for him, it could be real for you. You know. So the truth of the testimony matters. When Syl and Serena was telling their true stories about what happened and how God worked in their lives, it says something. It says because God really did actually work in their life, God can actually work in your life. And maybe he does. So the truth of the story really, really matters. Okay? In Exodus 20, 16, this is the Ten Commandments, right? It's the don't lie commandment. But it doesn't say don't lie. It says, you shall not give false testimony. Why? Because again, it's a courtroom type of thing against your neighbor. It's in a court of law. Don't give false testimony. When testimonies are supposed to be solemn, very um, serious, not necessarily like serious like in a courtroom setting, I mean, you can laugh, get that joke, right? But serious in the, in the, in the way that it's true. Serious in, in the way that you're saying, this is who God is, okay? And this is what he's really done, okay? So testimonies are supposed to be true. Um, the second thing I want you guys to know about testimonies is that testimonies are supposed to be, are, the key part of testimonies is remembrance. Okay? It's a remembrance. And um, remembering is a very, very important part of who God wants us to be. He wants us to be a people that remember. And if you just, I, I didn't do it, I, I mean, I, I didn't list it up here, but I, but I encourage you guys to go home, log into this website called BibleGateway.com and type in remember, okay? And read all the verses where it says remember. There's just a ton. It's all over the entire Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, and it's God remembering, God's people remembering, certain people remembering, and, and a lot of them they say God commanded us to remember. God tells us, remember, okay? Here are a couple examples, okay? In Deuteronomy 5.15, it says, remember that you were slaves in Egypt. God is telling his people to remember, okay? Um, and Deuteronomy 8.19 is telling God telling his people, do not forget, right? If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today. You will surely be destroyed, okay? He's saying, don't forget. You better remember what God has done. It's very important to remember. Okay? Um, and in Psalm 77, 11 and 12, here at the bottom, um, the psalmist says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles long ago. I will consider all of your works. I will meditate on all your mighty deeds. Remembering is a very important part of who God is and who he wants us to. When, with the Lord's Supper, when Jesus broke bread, he said, do this in remembrance of me. Right? He didn't say, do this because this is the law. I command you to do this. I mean, he did say that. But. <laughs> <laughs> the part of the reason why it was so important to do it is so that we can remember. There's something about remembering that grounds you in who you are, grounds you in who God is. And helps you to remember where you came from. And helps you to remember who you're supposed to be. Okay? It's a connection. Helps you connect to God. Helps you connect to each other. Right? In 1 Peter 12, 
15, this is our passage again. It says, I will always remind you of these things. It is right to refresh your memory. You will always be able, to, after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. It's very important to Peter that you remember what's going on. You remember what God did. You remember what Jesus did. Okay? So that is what testimony helps us to do. And when Peter gave his testimony, when Peter told what he did, he was remembering what Jesus had done. Okay? So uh, remembering through testimony is very important. Um, I'm going to wrap up really quick. Okay? So I'm almost short of time. <laughs> um, the first thing I want you guys to do is as we're telling testimonies, and, and remember this truth telling is supposed to build each other up as a church. We're helping each other to remember God. We're telling truth into each other's lives, right? Um, in order to do this, in order to build up the community, God wants us to remember. And a lot of these commands that he asks us to do is to ask us to remember as a community what God has done. Okay? So, first tip is remember something, a time when God did something in your life. Alright? That's the first thing. You don't need to say anything yet. Just think. Just remember. Remember God. I, I've talked to a lot of you guys. Even a lot of you guys in youth group or in middle school, you think, God's done things in your life already. You've told me. Remember those things. It's important just to, just to take some time and think and remember. A lot of times we go through life really fast and we don't remember a lot of things, right? And because of that, we don't live our life like this. So it's important just to take some time just to remember things. When I was little, my parents really annoyed at me when they, uh, they would say, hey, did you clean your room? Or I remember I told you to clean your room, I forgot. That was my excuse for everything. I forgot. Or they would get my report card and then the, the teacher was like, he had turn in like five assignments or whatever. And then they're like, how many you in five assignments? I forgot. I didn't remember I got into class and I didn't remember. Um, I, I, I think I told you guys this story before. I went into in college. I went to class one day. I was like preparing for the final exam. I studied super hard for the final exam. And then I sat down and the professor said, okay, before we take our final exam, turn in your final papers up here. I said, uh, I forgot that we had to do a final paper, right? I forgot, and my parents hated that because they thought it meant that I didn't care, okay? They thought it meant like, oh, I don't care about school, so I won't remember. Maybe a little bit of that. <laughs> but really, um, a lot of times I would forget just because I was thinking too much about something else. It's not that I didn't care to do my, 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 my final paper. Obviously, I wanted a good grade because I focused so hard on doing my final exam, right? But I focused too hard on doing my final exam that I forgot about something else. It wasn't that I didn't care about my grade. Obviously, I cared about my grade. It's just that sometimes you focus too much on one, and some of these things are good, but you need to focus and turn your eyes on the other things, too, that you need to remember. And that's what we need to do with God. There's tons of things to think about in life. Your homework, um, cleaning up your room, turning in papers, doing your final exam, going to work, you know, remembering that project, um, picking up something you're supposed to pick up, running this errand. Billions of things you need to think about in life. But if you focus on those things and you don't take time to remember, you will forget. And you'll forget what God has done for you. So the first thing is, I want you guys to remember. I don't think I have a slide for that. Yeah, I forgot. <laughs> to make the slide. It's not because I didn't care. I'm kidding. <laughs> I just focus on something else. Anyway, take time to remember God and what he's done. And then the second thing is really, I mean, not so easy. It's a little bit harder. It's to tell someone, right? Tell someone pretty um, logical step, because I'm talking about testimony. Right? So remember what 
something like I've done. It doesn't have to be how you came to Christ or a big story about that. It could just be, hey, oh, I remember God did this for me. Oh, I remember I was, you know, feeling down and God gave me a birth. Or I feel like I was, I was really stressed and God sent or so-and-so told me to cheer up and I felt cheered up. And I think God did that, you know. It could be something simple like that. But you can tell someone. You don't have to come. Not all of, I am going to ask. I think it should be a part of our church where we're like a community. We talk to each other. That's what this entire truth telling series is about. Where we can come up in front of everyone and tell everyone. You know, it doesn't, but it doesn't have to be like that. You can just tell one person. That's a good place to start. Tell your best friend. You know, that's the easiest person to talk to, right? Um, or if you're in a fellowship in a small group, you know, less people, it's a little bit easier to tell a testimony. To tell about how to do that. Tell someone. Take the initiative. Say, hey, I got something to tell you. God did this. You know? All right? Um, in Psalm 71, it says, I will tell everyone about your righteousness. I think it's verse 15. All day long I will proclaim your saving power, though I'm not skilled with words. I will praise your mighty deeds, O sovereign Lord. I will tell everyone that you alone are just. Telling people about what God has done is, is worship. And it's encouraging other people. It's so good. There's just so many good things. Just do it, okay? <laughs> you know? It's awesome. Um, the last thing that you can do, this is probably the hardest one. Okay, so first thing, remember Level two is tell that story to someone. Level three, advanced. If you're advanced, only if you're advanced, you do it, okay? <laughs> Ask someone what's God been doing in your life. Okay? That's kind of hard. Because it's like, you don't want to ask someone such a... And if someone asks you this, don't feel like they're putting pressure on you. Okay? What they're doing is they're just, they want to hear something good to encourage themselves. If you feel down about, oh, where's God? I don't know where God is. Sometimes you feel like that, right? Where's God been? Ask someone. Hey, has God been around in your life? Has God showed up? That's what that question is about. That's why we ask that question. It's, so, yeah, it is to remind each other, to keep us accountable, but don't think of it like that. It's really to encourage each other. For you to encourage someone else, for someone else to encourage you. Hey, where's God been? Has anyone seen him? Any sign of God lately? I haven't seen him. And someone will tell you, I've seen him. Someone will, if you ask, right? So those are the three things. Remember time when God did something in your life. Two, tell, tell someone. And three, ask someone. Where's God been? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your truth. I thank you for testimony. I thank you for your word. And I thank you for stories, Lord. And I pray that you'll give us stories and you'll work in our lives and you'll give us stories about how the awesome things you've been doing. That we will be able to remember them and we'll be able to tell someone. We ask each other.